Hello. Oh. Hello. Okay, I think you can hear me. So welcome to this session about uh, life after the hack. Uh, just to be perfectly clear, the, the, the word hack in this context is used to describe an intrusion. It's not about having hacked the, the code of Drupal core of our country on your site. So we, are, we will be talking about the security issue and uh, handling. So a few points to set up the context. And then we will talk about how you prepare snapshots of your sites after an intrusion, how you maintain your web presence even though you have been hacked, how you manage communication during a time of crisis, how you can go about rebuilding your site or repairing it, how you manage to find how your site was hacked, and what to do when you're back online. First, let's check some facts. How many people in this room have already had a hacked site? One over there, two, three, four, five, oh yes, six. That's a good proportion. And then, now, who feels ready to face a hacked server? I suppose the ones who were hacked now know what to do and feel more ready, do you? Do you? Yeah. Oh, not yet? Ah. Among those who feel they are ready or not, actually, do you have a formal contingency plan? What to do if these things happen? Does anyone have such a plan? Yeah, One, someone has half a plan, apparently. Yes, that's good. <laughs> Okay, you know there's one plan available on Drupal.org, and it's at this node, 2365547. Actually, about one-third of this presentation is built around that page. If you have never seen it, you probably should. Look for this, it's made simpler. My site has been hacked, now what? On this page, you will find a lot of pointers. Some of them have been read during this presentation. I have expounded on the forensic part, mostly. But the first steps in remediation and handling the crisis are well described in this page already, so you can rely on it. One thing I must stress, I am not a lawyer, and I am not your lawyer. So go get one any, any time. Well, everything I say in this presentation should be considered as information and not as advice for your specific uh, situation. Right? Right. This being said, uh, who am I? I think you may not know me. So I've been doing Drupal uh, for over 10 years now, 11 actually. And I'm a Drupal consultant. I'm not part of a, building, a site building agency I'm no, or any kind of uh, company which builds websites. Most of the time, I work for such companies or for companies who have internal teams to, to build their sites. And for that reason, since I'm not competitive with the site building companies, I get called a lot by all of them in France, mostly, because I'm French, as you can probably hear. And I work on, I've been working on fixing broken sites, or broken in sites, which is uh, most of the same situation except for the motivation, uh, since 2008. Doing audits, uh, fixing technical flaws, and addressing intrusions and exploits. I've been doing this mostly in the French media and government sites. And currently, I'm a professional member of the security team. I have been for a number of months already. So, let's imagine you are working. This is a normal day at the office. You just started uh, your daily Scrum, because you probably all use Scrum anyway. And then the phone rings. Someone has noticed something suspicious on the site. It takes usually less than two minutes for Twitter and Reddit to start buzzing about the problem if you have a high-profile site, which happens often in government and media. 
and usually uh, in less than 10 minutes, uh, the phones start to ring all over the place, and you have the C-level exe execs uh, calling uh, to ask what happens, and the journalists, oh, someone seems to have lit that already. <laughs> so, uh, this is uh, your role on adventure. What are you going to do at this point? Any idea? Well, first, you need to get ready. And a very good idea I found on this Drupal.org page, which had not been formalized before, is that you start by taking two scratch pads. Not one, not your PC, two scratch pads. And on one of them, you will take notes about what you discover, and you note all your, uh, all your thoughts while you are uh, trying to guess what has been happening. And every, every finding goes in the first log, and you timestamp it. You, you will see why at the end of the, the presentation. And you put numbers on every item. On the second log, you put your ideas about solutions and anything that will arise, because with the stress of the moment, you will notice that you get many ideas which come back to you from having maybe thought before, and which then float again to the surface, oh, I should do this, we need to do this for the next time. Don't put it in the discovery log, put it in an ID log, because once you will be, it will be finished, you will go through both logs, but differently. If you have an ID which refers to an actual issue, cross-reference cross it with the number of the issue, which is why you put the issue on the first log. And once you have these, uh, these two scratch pads and the pen to write on them, the first thing you do is to take snapshots. The, the goal of the snapshots is to allow you to perform forensics while you, when you are going to try to find out what happened really. Of course, your business types on the company will probably all uh, be shouting over you to restore the site and to go back online. You can just restore the, the, the backup from before the, uh, the crash or before the hack. But it's no good because uh, possibly a few minutes later, since you have the same code, you have the same vulnerability, and you will, uh, are likely to be hacked again in the same way. So you need to have uh, these snapshots so you can work on them to diagnose what happened and not um, uh, be uh, caught in the, the, the emergency of the moment. If you uh, think of um, police uh, movies, you are preserving the crime scene, actually. So that means snapshot everything. And how do you go about snapshotting? The best, usually, practice is to pull the plug, in a way. What does that mean? It means that uh, it's, if it's actual hardware in your server room, which tends to be rare these days, you just go about and you just switch power off without waiting for anything. No shutdown process, nothing. Why do you, you want to do this? Because code can detect and in a, show, a server which is shutting down. And some advanced malware can remove itself or erase, erase its strikes during the shutdown. You don't want this to happen. You, you don't want any kind of corrective action to happen while the servers are going down. And the only way to do that, usually, is to effectively remove power to the server. You also, you have code which can self-destruct on, on network loss. So even if you just unplug the servers from the network, virtually or physically, at the switch level, a server, uh, a code, an exploit, which has already opened a connection to an upstream server of its own, can detect that the network has been shut and can decide to disappear, depending on the motivation of its owner. This is uh, easy on physical hardware, not so much otherwise, but if you are on a virtual machine, you can just kill it forcefully, not using a shutdown again. If you are on remote servers not virtualized, it can be a bit more difficult, because even if you have a remote control card on your machine, these will try, in most cases, to send the power down signal to perform a shutdown. Also, you may fear losing data. If your, your system is installed on a journal file system, like the JFS, XFS, and several others, you will never lose files that way. 
what you can lose in some cases will be data in the databases. Also, you will lose everything in in-memory caches like memcached. We'll see later why this can be important. And obviously, there will be an increased service interruption. Your site was hacked, so the service was not nominal. But if you remove uh, the servers, everything suddenly completely stops, which is usually bad for business. So what do you want to shut down while you're while you doing this? Of course, you are, you are probably thinking of the database, of the files, but that's not all. Uh, the first line of protection on your infrastructure is, is usually the reverse proxy. You don't normally have access to the CDN logs anyway. So you want to preserve the logs of the reverse proxy if you have them enabled. You want to preserve everything on your web fronts. And I don't say web front in the singular because the intrusion may have been present only on one of several web heads. So you need to back up them all. You need, of course, to back up your, web your database servers. If you have a slave, as most of you have, you probably want to back all the database servers just in case of database corruption. And of course, file servers for the same reason. But there's more. All of this assumes uh, an island server, but most uh, sites, larger sites, don't work in isolation. So they rely on external resources. So you, may, uh, you probably have external logs on a SaaS service or you are performing transactions with the, the enterprise ERP, or with any kind of outside resource like a payment platform. Also, your infrastructure people probably have logs in their inclusion detection systems and the firewall. Every, everything should be taken, copied, so they have snapshots. And for after that only, you can start the next step. Remember, in all cases, just because your site has been hacked does not mean your site was the target. We had that in France uh, some time ago for uh, a television uh, company, which uh, was called uh, TV5Monde, and uh, the, they were severely hacked by virus means, and the actual target was uh, the, the office automation infrastructure climbing back to the servers and to the antennas, not the site itself which actually just resisted. So if you have stopped all your servers, how do you maintain or re-establish a basic web presence as soon as possible? First possibility, you have taken the snapshot and you restore uh, operation. You just mask the obvious intrusion and you continue work as if nothing had happened. This has an advantage in that it won't tip off hackers that you know what's going on or that you are competently diagnosing what's going on. And also for the business, it can help you continue to generate short-term value. So this will be appealing to business types. However, since your site has been hacked, you don't know to what extent, and uh, the damages which are present in your sites can increase if there's a bot on the site, it can send more data while you are trying to still uh, resume your operation. So the company responsibility may increase both in legal, legal terms, financial, if some operations are sent to the payment servers because your password phrase has been found on the servers by a hack. I just found this 15 minutes ago, a hard credit um, a passphrase on the site. Assuming the site was hacked, any uh, attacker could know the key of the, the Ogone payment platform and send payments to himself. And of course, even outside these considerations, there's the moral responsibility that all site editors have. Publishers, sorry. A side note. Sometimes you need to remember that just like you have a workflow for, to build a site, attackers have their workflow too. And for the most advanced attacks, you will see that the, the, it, they are led in a multi-point uh, strategy. First, there's the break-in, and you notice that or not. Then, 
using the exploit which, which they have found, the attackers will go to the site and try to find what is of value on the site, even if they don't know it first. That's digging for gold. Then, in most cases, it, they will implant some software on your system. This was very frequent with the Drupal Geddon flows, for instance, where you would find modified files and modified routers and things like that, which would direct uh, to any uh, to code capable of executing any code from just a web request. That's the zombie. And then, and maybe you are not expecting this, nothing. It all keeps quiet. There's no uh, work performed by the bot. There's no data transmission, nothing. All is quiet, and you think that nothing has happened. If you haven't detected the, the exploit at that time, you don't notice, and it's business as usual. This is the worst, because after some time, your backup plan has recorded every version with the exploit in place. It has removed. The, the safe versions you had previously, because uh, you only can only have such a, such a backup window, you are not backuping everything for uh, eternity. And after some time, you no longer have a reference sane uh, system. At that point, the attacker start, can activate his zombie and take profit from what it is it's able to perform. And since you don't have any backup, from the previous time before the exploit, you don't know what you can compare your site to in order to find what happened. This is quite smart, and this is the, uh, one of the high-tech uh, types of attacks. More commonly, however, you have the, the fast winner who's uh, like a need for speed. It will use an exploit as soon as possible. It try to use this, your servers as long as it's still available, possibly to send spam, to, to, the, to broadcast viruses and things like that. And actually, this is usually what causes the least loss, because this doesn't last long. It is easily detected, and it won't re-happen uh, re once you have fixed the issue, because you see it immediately, and you can act fast. The most uh, preoccupying type of attack, I would say, is the hidden steal. That means your site has been hacked, someone has broken in, they have found the goal they wanted on the other site, they have used whatever tools they wanted, to, and they have taken the resources. But remember, a digital resource doesn't disappear when you use it, so you, there's no track that, is, that has been actually used. This can be a password, this can be protected content, anything like that. There was a data steal recently in a major scientific library which, uh, uh, for journals which have paid readership, and every publication was put uh, for public uh, use outside the, this protected paywall, uh, possibly ruining the publisher. And if the attacker is really smart, before ending uh, their operation, they will close the door behind them. There was an exploit, okay. I'm, I've done what I wanted, now I fix the problem and my code disappears. And again, like in the middle of the first type attack, you don't know the problem has happened, and sometimes the data won't be uh, made available after, until soft, some time after, again, when you don't, no longer have tracks in your logs because you, you don't keep logs long enough. That's uh, attacker workflows. There are many variants, but these are the most common. So considering this, how do you restore presence or maintain presence even though you have been hacked and you are possibly in the second type of uh, strategy? Basically, what you want, and the, the cheapest way to restore some kind of presence before really fixing the issue, is to have a static site. If you haven't planned for it, it's simple to deploy in very short time, in a few minutes, one would say. Of course, it's best if you have planned it, you have designed it, you have prepared your communication for, for that time, but you can still go ahead and find your pages from your CMS. Of course, if everything is broken, you don't have access to all the pages. You can't re regenerate everything as a static site, otherwise you would just do it that way. 
But what you can do is fetch the data from cache, because in Drupal, the cache page holds all the pages which have been accessed since the latest flush. And if it has been flushed, you will also find them in the reverse proxy logs uh, cache, actually. So if you have a varnish, you can go to varnish and fetch your pages, extract them, put them to an HTML file, and serve them uh, as a static files from a small server instance, which you have just for that case. We have uh, a national radio company in France, for instance, with, uh, which has one type of infrastructure, but just for extra overloads like those, uh, those attacks or this type of uh, flows, they have small Nginx instances on the very front end of the, of the infra, which can take over when there's no longer any resource behind them to work. This is a good strategy which doesn't require significant resource in, in normal operation. A better solution, of course, is to still have a site and uh, possibly with a reduced bandwidth, a reduced capacity, but uh, still maintain operational uh, capabilities. This is very frequent outside the web world in enterprise uh, setups where you have a, you know, what is called a backup site which can still make, uh, perform the most urgent procedures in the company. This also exists for the web. But then you need to choose who do you serve if you have a high traffic and you can't serve them all from that infra, of course. Also, uh, assuming you, uh, you resume serving pages from a backup on that infra, what that doesn't solve if, is if you still continue working and publishing updates for your readers, for instance, how will you migrate them back to the main infra while it, when it returns online? If you haven't planned for it, it's yet more work to perform. Finally, for smaller sites, or when you don't have an internal team or a regular service company working for you, there are still social networks. It's a very good, efficient way to reach your audience even when everything is down because they will maintain presence for you. They're always there. And in many ways, uh, large social networks like Facebook, Google+, Plus, Twitter, and whatever are authoritative for your readership as much as your own site in many cases. But that means that you need to prepare for that too. If you are in the case, where you outsourced your devel the development of the website to one company. And then that company has a developer who set up the application and the, uh, the Facebook account for that application. And then the developer went away. And the company who they developed the site no longer has the Facebook account access. And you, as the site holder, don't have it either. How do you communicate when you don't act have access to the site? you don't have an official voice. So this is something which needs to be uh, ensured before anything happens. Always, as a customer, as the end user of the site, have an official account and be sure that you can handle it. I know someone in this room knows uh, a case in which this uh, is happening. Another thing which you need to do if you are going to have a web uh, use social network as your backup means, you, you need to include it in your regular communication because otherwise users won't know that you have an official presence and can wonder if this page is really of, so, as official as it looks. By including it in the long-term communication, possibly by publishing from the sites regularly, the, the authenticity and the authority of the page is good and you can communicate even if the, it's uh, all you have left. Now, uh, since you are at the Dave days, you are likely uh, the developers, uh, you are tech people. So who do you communicate with when you have such a case? Of course, you communicate with the site stakeholders. You don't keep it just for you. This is a temptation, of course. But really, uh, a web presence with a hack is a company-wide issue. So it, go, uh, it should go all the chain up to the sea level. And you must not, in most cases, take initiatives behind uh, preparing your snapshots. In some cases, especially in dysfunctional companies like the very, very large ones, people may fear reprisal internally. They, they may fear a gag order in a political context, 
or if uh, the discovery comes from the outside, they may fear a slap action to be sure that uh, the company um, uh, we, uh, will try to de uh, disable them from talking about the issue for, just to preserve its reputation. There are protection systems in many countries for that. In France, we have this in uh, Law Sapin 2. In Italy, since we are in Italy, I, find, uh, I found one system for whistleblowers in banks. In the US, there's a whole arsenal about anti-slap litigation, and many country, other countries have similar rules. So any time you discover such an issue, you should not, in these countries, fear whistleblowing. Assuming you are the person in charge, you are the C-level executive uh, who was informed by tech that there was an issue, whatever the size of your company. What does it mean? I would say the first step you should go is call your legal counsel. You need a lawyer to be sure that whatever you do won't, uh, won't uh, increase your liability. And then, as he may advise you, there are crisis management special specialists. Large companies already have them. Smaller ones may need to find one in an emergency. And then, law enforcement. Many countries in the EU have a specialized, a specialized units, so don't go straight to the normal police, but try to find the access to the cybercrime unit. It's more efficient. And finally, after you have done all this preparatory work, you need to warn sites operating on the same server. If you are on a small site, you are working on a shared uh, hosting. Also, sites on the same network, again, to take the example from that television company, just because uh, your servers on the web infra have been hacked doesn't mean the target was not uh, the IS infra. And also business partners. Again, if someone stole your, uh, your payment credentials, then you need to, uh, to inform the payment company as soon as possible. The last uh, point about communication is uh, privacy issues. In make, many cases, any uh, intrusion means a data leak. Either it has happened, and the hackers have actively taken control of private, uh, personal, personally identifiable data, as they're called, or you won't be able to prove that they did not take advantage. There's no plausible denial that uh, attackers have the passwords. Also, if you are running an e-commerce site, for instance, you may have constraints from your uh, certification authority, say PCI DSS for commerce, for instance. Of if you are working for health in the US, you have a clause in the HIPAA uh, system which mandates um, uh, disclosure, require, disclosure obligations uh, for such uh, breaches. And finally, even if you are not mandated by law to publish this information, you need to control the damage to your public image. Uh, we have an interesting case, two interesting cases in France uh, in uh, past years about Drupal sites which got hacked. For instance, in, uh, the, in 2009, I think, there was the national French official site called France.fr, which was uh, one of the first government for, uh, Drupal sites which just crashed under load and then was attacked. And uh, the, uh, the, the prime minister offices chose not, not to communicate at all on that, and uh, they just hid. And uh, the, the blogosphere, as you can imagine, just went mad with that and uh, built every kind of scenario of what uh, had happened and how people were incompetent and how open source was bad and Drupal was the worst. It was awful, it lasted for several weeks, until uh, we finally uh, published the new version of the <coughs> the new version of the site sorry in comparison one just uh, two years later i was working for a major french uh, media company and uh, there was a similar breach and we were able to identify precisely what had been modified and accessed it, and it started the same way. In the f first hours, uh, the blogosphere started to, uh, to, uh, to talk about that. There were tweets. There was a specialized blogger like, called Corbin in France who, uh, who would have an inflammatory uh, track about uh, this uh, hack, again claiming ir irresponsibility of publishers. And then, just one day later, after the problem had been fixed, 
the media published a full account of what had happened. You see, yes, we were using this release of Drupal. We, are, we had this module which was not patched, and the flow was of this kind. It enabled this type of attack, and we fixed it that way. This is why we can say that this happened. We found that in our logs. And it was amazing, because 10 minutes later, everything stopped. The, the bloggers started, oh, they have published an account, and they are not just making fun of us and pretending nothing happened. And it just died. The next day, there was nothing more about this flow. So I think this is a very interesting comparison. By really be, um, being open about what, what happens, you can gain more respect and more trust and avoid communication damages. So the crisis is there. You have communicated as you, as you could, and you are starting to work on rebuilding, restoring, or whatever. What can you do? As I said, the first temptation is to rebuild the site just the same. Restore a backup and restart from, from there. I was reviewing this presentation earlier today, and some, uh, some major contributor in Drupal.org told me this was the thing he would do. Oh, yes, but the flow is still there, so you can still be attacked. Can you guess how worse it could be for your image if you were attacked, put offline, then come back online with the same site and a, a small uh, piece appeasing a word saying uh, there was a problem, and then you, go, you, you are offline again. Imagine how it can feel to the audience. So you don't want to do that. You need to do some fixing work before going back online. For that, the, the first approach is to try to keep the, the, the site and fix the flow as it is found and restore operation as soon as possible that way. It takes actually a lot of time and effort to review a large code base. And it's not sure you can ever completely trust it once it been, has been compromised once. Because remember, it's not just Drupal which may have been hacked. Drupal may have been the vector to infect something else outside your doc root on your server. And if you are a Drupal specialist, you're probably not as much of a system specialist, and vice versa. Another solution sometimes, and I've seen it happen too, is can we just throw away the site? Maybe it's not that bad. Many sites are event sites. They're built for an event, and they are kept in the, wrong, in the long term just because marketing says, oh, yes, we should keep it, but we don't have any budget to maintain it. Familiar with that, someone? Yeah, I see. And this can be just the trigger you need to have the site killed, and you're sure it will never again be uh, online. In most cases, however, this won't happen, and you want to restore. So you'll need ba backups from before the hack. And remember what I said earlier? If you have a smart hacker which intruded the site and let things stand for a number of weeks or months, you don't have any backups from before the hack, really. You don't know when, when it happened. There are strategies for that, and one of them is called the GFS rotation. It's not that frequent, but it's very useful. Basically, the idea for the GFS rotation is that you take uh, backups very frequently, either incremental or uh, complete, and then uh, that's for every hour, for instance, and then you take backups every um, day, and then other backups every week, and then every month, and you keep one backup per month, one per week, one per day, and one per hour or at least for as, as many as the next step of granularity. This means that you can restore to any hour in the past day, to any day in the past week, to any week in the past month. So you can go very far in time. And for instance, a complete rotation going to the, the year with daily backups only takes 23 copies of your data space. That's not so much in, in most cases. And then you can keep a whole year of backups. And adding more years just takes uh, one more copy per year. It's not that much to be able to bisect when the problem happened and to, uh, to, to have a safe point of reference when you're trying to restore. 
you have uh, this can be performed by your hosting company. There are open source solutions for that, Amanda and Bakula being the best known. But what if you don't have uh, a, the correct preparation for this? You don't have good backups. You know uh, the backups cannot be restored. It always happens. Then remember, you still have your pre-production. You still have your continuous integrations builds, which can be used as a comparison against the snapshots of the, the live version, which was hacked. Because in most cases, your pre-prod won't be hacked. Your dev server, your Jenkins builds won't be hacked. They will be, in some cases, the closest you can get to a good version of the site. But in any cases, this is not entirely to be trusted. A better strategy? is to rebuild from the sources and then export. That's easy, that's reliable, but you have, need to have a code-driven process. You need to have a full export system for their content and be assured that it is kept offline on separate resources. And even if you restore that, which is reliable, you still need to fix the flow itself. It can take a lot of time if you have a very high volume site, but this can be alleviated if you take it from the start. Uh, we had an example for a large extranet uh, two years ago, which took 30 days to load the uh, first time. After several days of work, it just took two days. And finally, there are other cases. If you have a smaller site which has not been built uh, using the code-driven process, it will be longer, it will be less reliable and it won't, you won't have a chance to fix the process during the fix. Finally, you may want to start from scratch, but this is almost never an option because of the time it takes. So, how do you find what has happened? First thing, don't jump on your system. Apart from the snapshot, start by thinking. How did you become aware of the hack? Maybe your site was defaced, it's simple. Maybe you were just performing an upgrade and some update and transaction didn't work as it should. Maybe you were doing an inspection on a user account and you found something which was not uh, as it should. So take guesses. Imagine, do, uh, try to guess what can happen. And remember, even if something is not unlikely, it doesn't mean it's impossible. Your priority, once you have built that big list of ideas of what can happen, is try to first uh, uh, verify the easiest attacks, because in most cases, these will be the ones which have been used. If you don't find anything, the OWASP 10 list can give you uh, clues. And finally, Google is your friend in that case. You can search from specific patterns found on your site if they have been found elsewhere. Just one thing to keep in mind, just because you found an exploit doesn't mean there was only one. I recently had to work on a site which had been hacked seven times, and it was only seven times because the last we could find in the timestamps had applied the fix behind itself so that, so that there would be no more exploits on the same site. Anything you do modifies what you are observing because you are running a process on the server, you are leaving your own tracks. If you have a snapshot, you can regenerate a copy from the snapshot and work on the copy from the snapshot. There are classic well-known uh, flows, the code files, the permissions are, are often too weak on uh, many hostings. Many people use Nginx, but Drupal does not have Nginx support officially. And the group which adds support for safety on Nginx does not usually publish the fixes at the same time as the original publishes from core, which fix the issues with HT access. And possibly the best known flow is having in database PHP code. This is bad for perf, but this is this also means code which is often not reviewed. Outside Drupal, having a separate user to run your CLI operations command line and your web system enables you to find out if files have been created by the web user outside the files directory, in which case you know they are not uh, as they should, they should be. The timestamps of the files also can give you a clue. If they don't match the deployment time, this means something has happened which should not have. 
and remember to check outside the doc route. Drupal can help you for that. There's a module for that, as always. The hacked module won't prevent your site from being hacked, but it will enable you to see what has diverged from the country base. Other modules may provide code signing, like the MD5 check or file integrity. My own QA module, which you can find on GitHub, enables you to find a PHP code in your database. And before you are hacked, the security review module can help you find such flows. There are quick wins when you look at your DB. The user's table most often will be modified, or possibly the menu router table. You can check that the timestamps are consistent with, with, consistent with each other. A user should not have a last access time which is older than, he, than their login time. Other so similar criteria you will find when you read this, because I'm getting late with the presentation, sorry. And if you don't find anything in the quick wins, you can just diff the database in SQL form with uh, your reference version. There's a good tool for that by Altova, which is called Database Spy, enable you to compare, to compare databases. Along with the user's table, the session's table is very interesting sometimes. You can do links between your session's table and your user's table. But now remember, many sites want to use memcache for, or memcached for the sessions. But then if you pull the plug, they're lost. So remember, sessions are not cached data. They should not go in volatile storage. They should go in a database, be that the standard the Drupal database, or MongoDB, or Redis, or whatever. But don't, please, don't put them in a cache system. The last part of forensics, before you leave that to the professionals, is the logs. The sites should normally use off-site logs, meaning that if the sites are broken in, the logs will still be safe. They can be just warning logs, like you have in dblog and syslog or whatever, but you can also have a full transactional log, which you send to something like Apache Kafka, which contains all the record of your changes, and you send that off offline somewhere which enables you to rebuild your site at any time. The interesting part about this being that it will also record the intrusion while it's happening. <coughs> and as a last resource, last resort, sorry, there are specialized tools outside the Drupal world for security professionals. I listed two here. There's NKs from Guidance and the uh, Forensics Toolkit from Access Data. And there are specialized consultants with, uh, who work just with these tools and can help you as needed if you are, don't find anything on your own. <coughs> so you find the flow. You've, been, you've created a new build which runs uh, just fine. How do you go about restoring production? Well, you take your first pad, you know, you remember the one which contained all your findings, and you, would, you run all your findings against the new build to be sure that you, do, you didn't forget anything. In most cases, you will want to reset the passwords. There's a simple way to do that on Drupal 7, which is given on the Drupal page I showed initially. And you prepare some marketing and copy for the social networks to communicate about being back online and having improved your security and how that was a good occasion to learn for you. OK, you're back online, and you need to be ready for the future. You've done your duty. <coughs> what do you do now? Well, you, pre you go about preventing this from happening ever again. For that, that means improving developer knowledge about security. That means someone, or possibly everyone, should be on the security mailing list, or read the security team Twitter account. There's also an RSS feed at, a, at an easy-to-find URL, and Greggles, who now works at Card, I think, put out the, the authoritative book on Drupal security. Although it's getting old, because it was at the time between Drupal 6 and 7, if I remember, most of what, of what it describes is not specific to a given Drupal version, and it is still very worthy of reading even today. That book, that book if you don't know it, is called Cracking Drupal, a drop in the bucket. 
Also, such uh, operations are typically um, a reason to obtain funding and, uh, and ways to uh, improve your security posture, your, the process. What you can do is analyze the releases which are uh, marked as security releases, find what the fix was, deduce what the flow was, and then uh, scan your own code, code base for the custom code to see if you don't have a similar issue in your code, Scatgin, Catgin UHDs. Once you've done, done that, it's a good occasion to, to uh, allow um, developers to become contributors in Drupal. All of you here are probably already contributors, but maybe not everyone uh, out around you. Beyond security, it's also a chance to improve your quality process by generalizing uh, code reviews, peer code reviews, by having a code-driven process if you were doing an ad hoc, uh, ad hoc build previously, possibly by implementing quality tools in your continuous integration, maybe deploying a sonar with instrumentation on it, and maybe the simplest of all, uh, allowing your, your site to deploy contrib updates regularly on the schedule. Finally, because you can't improve what you don't measure, let's go back again to your, your first pad. I remember I told you to timestamp everything that had happened, all, everything you had tried, everything you had noted, and measure the time it took. When you go about that, you get an estimate of the time you take to perform such and such task. This can give you an, uh, a way to improve them because many of the discovery steps you will be taking can be done by scripts which you keep outside your system. So you can prepare yourself for the, for the next emergency situation and script some of your discovery, your analysis in order to improve your, your response time. This is a post-mortem. And then the ideal optimistic case is you can plan for intrusion simulations. Remember, it's good for fire pe firefighter people. It's good for us too. You can simulate an intrusion and uh, again measure what the time it takes your team to find what has happened. This, is, this means collaborating with a, a Tiger team, probably. And this is the, the final uh, point I wanted to tell you about. I'm ready for your questions, if you have any. Anyone? So you all feel safe now? Well, you'll, you'll find me uh, in the sprint room anyway. If you have uh, ideas uh, you don't want to expose in public anyway. Uh, thanks for being uh, here and attending and bringing me your attention. Thanks. Bye.